toute question ne se fonde jamais que sur une réponse. Y'all ever seen Pitch Perfect? It's this movie about a university that's populated almost entirely by collegiate a cappella singers. Anna Kendrick bangs on a cup and finds herself at college. Rebel Wilson does some improvising. There's mashups after mashups after mashups. Uh, it made $115 million. I got to thinking about it because I, I, wa I recently watched a video from my good friend and frequent collaborator, the Lit Crit guy, about the television show Criminal Minds. I think in it, John brought up some really important points. Because whilst the show is on the surface about the logical juridical response to serial crime, the show also seems to think that these crimes can happen to anyone, at any time, anywhere. Criminal Minds is the show that's about manifesting and performing paranoia. And there's something really remarkably authoritarian about this internalization of the discourses of the national security state. The idea that this over-the-top show about FBI agents who are also like psychic wizards fighting an completely ridiculous amount of serial murderers. How this places the onus on us, the viewer, to disseminate fear and paranoia amongst ourselves. Doing all of the work for the American deep state by imagining a you know, serial murderer around every corner just waiting to kidnap us and lock us in a basement and build a giant nest because they were obsessed with birds and had like a bad childhood or whatever. It got me thinking about Pitch Perfect because if Criminal Minds is a show about the internalization and dissemination of paranoia, then Pitch Perfect is a film about internalizing individuality itself. Pitch Perfect is a kind of ensemble film with the central cast as two collegiate a cappella groups at Barden University. The film takes us through the Barden Bella's journey to regionals and the ICCA finals, where of course they win. Um, it's this broad audience popcorn comedy with, you know, improvisation, Pratt Falls, and uh, a lot of joyful performance. This movie made me think about the production of desire. How desire is not a force that emerges from this perfect vacuum within human consciousness. Desire is learned, taught, and ultimately structured by a system of symbolic representations that emerge from language. Part of this is what the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan called the big other. The idea that desire does not belong to us, but is created within this fantastic system structured by ideology, by culture. Desire is not innate, it is learned. Anna Kendrick's character, Becca, is written as this self-possessed, aggressively independent, aspiring music producer who only joined college because her father, a Barden Complet professor played by my boyfriend John Benjamin Hickey, forced her into it. And she does absolutely everything in her power to express her reticence towards a cappella, college in general, and is really looking for an excuse to drop out. The plot of Pitch Perfect centers on the Barden Bellas, but the meta plot is a bet Becca makes with her father to join just one campus organization. You gotta try something new, Beck. Join one club on campus. And if, at the end of a year, you still don't want to be here, you still want to go off to LA and be P. Diddy, well then, you can quit college. Another important character, Benji, is an eager nerd who for some reason is obsessed with becoming a member of the Barden Treblemakers, an all-male a cappella group on campus, and the defending champions at the ICCA. He's sweet, he's awkward, he's obsessed with sleight of hand magic because sure, why not, this poor kid isn't already wearing a cape when we first meet him, let's have him be a magician. I mean, justice for Benji, he's He's a precious little baby deer. Why is this movie so mean to him? I mean, really, why is Becca a smart, 
talented, and funny young person obsessed with becoming a wage slave for the music industry. This was 2012. We are post MySpace, yet she wants to produce for a major label. Why is Benji a smart young person who honestly sings beautifully? Why is he so invested in the affirmation of a, and I want to emphasize this, collegiate a cappella group? Two characters, one who resists the dominant discourse in order to break out on her own so she can become a producer for a major label, basically a good, loyal, upwardly mobile worker, as soon as humanly possible, and the other, a victim of social gatekeeping, willing to continually subsume and honestly humiliate himself under the discursive gestures of collegiate a cappella, so much so that it encompasses his entire identity. No matter what you think of desire to be away from or to be closer to this group or that group, your desire is directed toward the big other, the field that structures our relations. Both Criminal Minds and Pitch Perfect are about the firm hand of desire, resting on the shoulders of these characters and directing our gaze toward a symbolic order under neoliberal culture. They inform and teach us how to desire after our entrance into the symbolic order, the world as we know it that's structured by human language. Man's desire is structured by the decentered big other, the symbolic order. What I desire is predetermined by the big other, the symbolic space within which I dwell. Even when my desires are transgressive, even when they violate social norms, this very transgression relies on what it transgresses. There's a scene in Pitch Perfect where Becca and her love interest, Jessie, sit in her dorm room after discovering that Becca doesn't like movies. What an absolute freak, by the way. After he figures out that she doesn't like movies, Jessie comes over to watch her watch the end of one of his favorite movies, The Breakfast Club. There's this really incredible moment when Becca, instead of watching the film, looks over at Jessie and watches him watch The Breakfast Club. This is the function of desire. We think our desires emerge within ourselves, but actually they're structured by our interactions with others, how we want others to see us. Becca, the most self-possessed and independent character in the entire film, is not and has never been free from desire. In the 10th episode of the third season of the NBC comedy Community, in an episode called Regional Holiday Music, we can see desire for what it truly is, an imposing force that goes largely unseen until manifested in the actions and behaviors of others. The episode finds the cast slowly becoming inoculated into the holiday musical by Mr. Rad, a music director and literal psychopath played by Taryn Killam. Uh, I thought I told you to call me Mr. Rad or Corey. Just don't call me late to dinner. Who is trying to replace the last Glee Club after they had a collective nervous breakdown when their Glee is taken from them. Apparently before this, the other entire Glee Club uh, died in a tragic bus crash, which... I'm not saying I killed the last Glee Club. The central cast of Community, the study group, uh, explicitly expressed their desire to do just about anything besides perform in the holiday musical. Pass. Yeah. Okay. But the affecting joy of holiday music finds each cast member becoming extremely enthusiastic about holiday mashups, singing and dancing, and going to regionals. Next stop, regionals! What the hell are regionals? They never stop talking about it. Regionals. Well, we're gonna need all hands on deck if we're gonna go to regionals. And they won't stop talking about regionals. We win regionals, then it's straight on to sectionals. And then a week later is semis, then semi-regionals, then regional semis, then national lower zone semis! It all begins when Mr. Rad uses Abed 
Fred's insecurity about the changes in his life, the treasured yearly Christmas celebration with his mother he longs for as the child of divorced parents, who's created the surrogate family out of his study group. I just want my friends and I to have a Merry Christmas together. The solution to a larger existential problem, uh, the changes that come with growing up and realizing your parents sometimes don't have your best interests in mind. For Abed, desire takes control and suppresses the anxieties of his day-to-day -day life. Our contemporary moment is mired with liberal cultural nonsense, these discursive mashups that always place the onus on the subject to reach within themselves repeatedly to determine their individual purpose, their identity, the magic within them. Our cultural moment is the Katy Perry discography. This is culture. Santa Claus was born in 1945. He had a boogie woogie Coca-Cola army. Chat. And when the Connie's gave the polio to Doris Day, Santa helped the Beatles take McCarthy away. That baby boomer Santa, he's never gonna die. Santa fought at Woodstock and Vietnam and smoked a ton of acid and burnt his bra. It's this pink slurry of concentrated chicken parts that are separated, battered, and fried into nuggets. It's disgusting, it's visually nauseating. Oh, but we love the nuggets, don't we? And likely not despite, but because of this function of culture, Pitch Perfect, with its mashups between A Thousand Miles and Titanium, its characters who openly admit their entire identities are filtered through pop culture, was a gigantic hit. Culture under neoliberalism doesn't have to follow a particular coherency because it's not about describing or portraying actually meaningful human experiences, but about capturing individual desire in perpetuity in such a way that one film, one TV show, one glee club can market to a gigantic audience. Most importantly, the way that I see it as an anti-capitalist. Under contemporary neoliberalism, culture is about how meaning and identity are just lying underneath the surface, ready for excavation. I've got the magic in me Every time I touch that track it turns into bone If you want to be a good, loyal, hard-working subject in contemporary capitalism, it is up to you to work hard and pull yourself up by your internal bootstraps to live your personal, authentic truth. What matters, as always in this economy, is the atomized, isolated individual. Explicit group identity is commie pinko terrorism or whatever, while feckless, implicit group identity, one of many self-actualized, self-possessed individual agents, is freedom. It is a cruel, mandatory exercise in self-expression that makes us feel like failures every time we realize that who we are is fleeting each time we fail to acquiesce to the dominant discourses of the social world rather than being able to admit that who we think we are is you know determined through in at least in part through this imposition of the big other it is your fault that you haven't found yourself whatever that's supposed to mean Pitch Perfect captures desire by magnifying the significance and importance of a cappella until it becomes the cast's entire personality. Oh, but I kind of thought this was, you know, just for Christmas. No, no, no. This is forever. This is what we do now. This is who we are. Vocal nodes are treated like cancer. The Breakfast Club becomes the vehicle through which young adult sexuality is allowed to be performed. And all of this is distilled, filtered, brought to its essence by a cappella. Rather than interpret or interrogate desire, in these contexts, we give it full agency in the form of an ever-present need to find and express ourselves. For the Bellas, it's an intergenerational feminism falling under the banner of the inner girl boss of modern culture. At the end of the day, we can all just get along, as long as we're becoming quote unquote who we really are. As long as when we're becoming who we really are, we are not too disruptive and we are not too aggressive in our push for change. It's insidious 
it's authoritarian, to place the onus on subjects to do the work for culture, to enforce and restrict themselves based on what the world expects, the means for being accepted, loved, and appreciated for who we are. This is a cruel way to treat people, and no amount of glee can fix that. This show is supposed to be gleeful and bright and fun, and you can let me do that or there can be another bus crash!